All right, all right, all right, all right. Are we happy to be in church this morning? We're okay? What's the 1130 crew like? Are we excited? Are we loud? Are we tired? Are we hungry? <clears throat> A little bit of all of the above. If we have not gotten the chance to meet yet, my name is Morgan May Truel, and I am the young adults pastor at our Bayside Granite Bay campus. This is my second time at Bayside Blue Oaks. I love being here. I get the awesome privilege of preaching the word of God to you today. Um, but before we get there, the last time I was here, I was about three months away from getting married, and I am now six months into getting married. It's kind of fun. Yeah, not, not a long time, but it's been a good time. Um, you guys didn't really warn us, though, about anything related to marriage, so thank you for that. Um, so I guess w when you get married, that person, they're just, they're just always there now, right? So that, that's it. Like, they, they're always that you wake up together, you go to sleep. They're there. No, I'm just joking. Um, it's been awesome. My husband, Benji, is here somewhere, and he probably hated that greet each other moment because he's about as introverted as it comes. I love it, and I love the chance to be with new people, to be with new churches, and I am so thankful that you guys would have me today. We get the chance to read the Word of God together this morning. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, continuing our unstoppable series going through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 to be exact, and here's what I love about this paragraph we get to read today. This paragraph is God's description of what the church should be. This is the church. So we get to read this today and we get to apply the early church strategy and practice to our current church strategy and practice. I thought a good way to start would be to read the word of God together this morning. So we're gonna read all the verses that we're gonna go through and we're gonna read it together right now out loud. You don't do this every Sunday. It won't be creepy. We're gonna go for it, okay? Everyone together now. Acts chapter two, verse 42 says this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. It was really good. You, you speak kind of low, which sounds a little creepy, but that's okay, we're gonna move past it. This is the word of God and this is God's church. Before we actually get into, we're gonna actually break this up into line by line kind of teaching today. Because if we're not careful, we read a passage like that and everything just sounds so picture perfect, it sounds so ideal. But underneath each of those lines we just read is some hard work, some diligent church stayers that create the most beautiful early church and it's a church that we can have today. Before we get into any of that though, there's some context that needs to be shared. So first things first, we know that God sent his only son Jesus down to this earth to live a perfect and sinless life that you and me, we could never live. He died a death on the cross for our sin. He rose from the dead and in this single most loving, sacrificial, generous act, Jesus took care of the problem of sin and death and evil. He made a way for broken people like you and me to have a relationship with a holy and righteous God. After he went back up into heaven, he came down and he spoke to his disciples and he gave them this thing that we like to call the Great Commission. It's in Matthew chapter 28. He says to his disciples, I want you to go therefore into all the nations and make disciples. He gives them their calling. This is interesting because the church and the people in the church are always asking that question. What's my calling? What has God specifically put me on this earth to do? What are my gifts? What are my skill sets? What do I have to add to the church? What is my calling? And obviously that journey of figuring out what you're supposed to do and what you're made to do is a worthy venture, but we always have to remember that each one of us in this room has already received the greatest of all callings, which is the Great Commission to go into all the nations and make disciples, to go everywhere and introduce people to Jesus and help them understand what it means 
to follow him, okay? So the great commission was given to the apostles, the disciples, they begin to preach about Jesus to anybody who will listen. And at this day and time where we picked up reading today, there is a feast, a celebration, Coachella for the Jews, if you will, happening in Jerusalem, right? Everyone's gathered together for the same purpose. There was a feast of weeks or some would call it Pentecost. This was a long celebrated tradition in Jewish history. So think about it this way, 25,000 people approximately lived in Jerusalem at this time. On the day of Pentecost and for that celebration, over 100,000 people would descend on Jerusalem to celebrate. There's a lot of people in Jerusalem right now. The Holy Spirit falls. People hear a sermon, a Holy Spirit gospel-centered sermon given by a guy named Peter And overnight, the church goes from 120 people gathered together to 3,000 plus people. A radical move of the Holy Spirit. A megachurch is birthed overnight, it seems. But now, with a lot of growth, needs to come some structure. Things that grow have to have order for them to continue growing in health. So that is where we get the passage that we just read together. This is what the early church should look like and act like. So we're gonna go together. We're gonna dig through this line by line. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. All right, here we go. Verse 42 says this. They, they is the early church and they should apply to us as well. They devoted themselves. Can you circle that word devoted for me? We'll come back to it in just a second. They devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The apostles' teaching would have been the word of God. They devoted themselves to the teaching of God's word. They devoted themselves to fellowship, which which would have been community. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, which would have been relationships outside of just the temple, mealtimes, social experiences that would have ended with a taking of the Lord's Supper. But it was social, it was personal, there was friendship here. And it was taking the church, not just in the church building, but also taking the church out of the building and into the homes. They were devoted to prayer, last but not least. We're a praying church, and the early church was a praying church as well. Now go back to that word devoted for just a second, because all of that sounds good, but we have to go backwards and really decide, what does the word devoted mean? Because in our American context today, I would say that many of us feel as though we are devoted to our husband or our wife. We are devoted to our jobs. We are devoted to our kids. It's like a loving adoration sort of feeling. We're devoted to our favorite sports teams, the Dallas Cowboys or the Giants or whatever your thing is. I don't really get it, but whatever your thing is, they do, we devote ourselves to such things, right? That word devotion doesn't necessarily mean A love for, the actual appropriate translation for this word devoted, means to continue steadfastly. To continue steadfastly. In other words, they devoted themselves, meaning they persevered. They stayed. They persisted. Now let's get real for a second. The passage that we just read doesn't sound exactly like the American church, does it? Let me confess to you for just a second. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. When I went to college, that was my first time when I uh, started church shopping for the first time, right? You familiar with this term, church shopping? You basically make a list of all the things that you want in a church, and then you go try some out and make sure that it has all of your shopping list items. And if it has all those items, then you're good to go. You're good to plug in, right? In my young adult years, my shopping list was pretty shallow, I'm not gonna lie. I tried out a few churches, and my big requirements were, first and foremost, are there young adults that go to the church? I want there to be a thriving young adults population. I also want those young adults to look cool and to dress cool so that I know that I'll fit in with them. Um, I would like for there to be a coffee shop, maybe in the church, so that I can study there and so it has good coffee. I want the pastor to be animated and funny and tell stories, but also I want him to be a really serious biblical Bible teacher. And also I want the staff to notice me and to think I'm awesome. So if they don't notice me or they don't know if if I miss a weekend, then I'm out, I'm not gonna do that, right? That was my young adult church shopping list. And I'm not going to lie to you. I walked away from a ton of great churches because it didn't meet my requirements. And those were just my silly 
college Morgan shopping items. What about the ones that we have today? Maybe even some of the ones that you consider when you were trying to decide where you were going to plant. So first, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna go to that church because I'm really, I'm really into serving and I think serving is one of the most important things we do in the church. So that church really isn't a serving church. I'm not gonna go there, right? Or, you know, I'm really into community and I really want there to be like a thriving small groups population. So that church just doesn't really do groups well. So I'm not gonna plug into that church. You know, I was really hoping for a small group that meets in my cul-de-sac on Wednesdays between the hours of one and 2 p.m. And it doesn't really have that. So I'm, I'm not gonna plug in there. You know, I want my kids to love the kids ministry and I want there to be like massive kids camps and you know, it just doesn't have a big playscape in the lobby. My kids, they really like it when giant trees are in the lobby of my church. And if it doesn't have the giant tree, I just don't know if it's for us, right? Now, these are just our preferences. So we church shop, right? Now, obviously, I'm not trying to make light of the fact that oftentimes we want to make sure that the church we are attending and partnering with matches our set of beliefs and our vision that we see biblically. So don't get me wrong, there is wisdom in which you should choose a church. But those things that I just listed don't necessarily sound like their wisdom or if they are, like the small groups culture, the serving culture, maybe you're meant to come in and be a part of fixing that. So that's one, that's one sort of idea that we as the American church, we're very much into our preferences and our desires being met. We want the church to meet our needs, okay? The other aspect to the American church is that we tend to divide. We have a reputation of being divided, I, I would say, to the outside world. When there's drama, when there's disagreements, when there's church hurt, right, we tend to divide. When the pastor doesn't preach as conservatives, conservatively as I think he should, I'm gonna divide. If my pastor doesn't preach as liberally as I think he should or she should, I'm going to divide. If my pastor doesn't explicitly talk about the issues of today, I think I'm going to leave. If my small group leader causes some, some sort of discussion that gets awkward that I don't agree with, I'm gonna divide. We tend to be divisive people who leave at very small, sometimes non-essential things. I will be personal with you for just a moment. I just took over a new role at our Granite Bay campus as the young adults director. And I'm not going to lie to you when I say a significant chunk of the students in that ministry left when I took this job because I'm a woman. Now, that's their belief, that's their preference, but I am saying we tend to divide and leave over matters that might not be essential, matters even in some instances that might seem trivial to you. Now, hear me correctly. There are legitimate reasons to leave. Right, A lot of you in here, you have been through some significant church hurt, maybe even some betrayal, and you have left a situation that has been unhealthy for you, and I respect that. Some of you in here have had to leave churches that you've loved because your leadership has changed their view on something biblically that you do not believe that you can stand for, and I respect those decisions. But I want us to call attention to the fact that the American church, in some of the trivial things, is known for being a little bit consumerist and a little bit divisive when I don't believe we have to be. I believe we have to get back to what the original definition and the original purpose is for the church. This series we're in is called Unstoppable. So if the church knows who it is and has its North Star exactly identified, the church truly move, will move in an unstoppable way. But we have to get there and we have to start somewhere. So can we define what the church is and what the church is not? So first, the church has to be awake. It says in the word, the church woke up and then it devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. So we're awake, we're good? Okay, so here's what the church is. Here is what the church is. The church is the people of God that have put their faith in Jesus Christ. The church is not a building. The church is the people of God acting in unity. The church is God's vessel to reach the ends of the earth for the sake of the gospel. And this is God's vessel in the business of life or death kind of stuff. We're in the business of seeing God bring dead things back to life, God restoring marriages, God rescuing addicts. We are in the business of seeing real life or death transformation and the church is God's vessel. The church is God's plan to seeing that happen. The church gatherings 
are for the purpose of realigning, getting recentered on God's truth and knowing which direction we are supposed to go, not just for you in your individual lives, but also for us as a community. If an entire community got realigned in the truth of what God has said in his word, this church would be un. Stoppable. We don't just come here for a fun Sunday with songs and dances and people raising their hands and some loud girl preaching at me for 30 minutes. That's not the only reason why we come. We come here to realign, to get recentered on God's truth, to get reminded of God's goodness and God's faithfulness in our lives, not just for us as individuals, but as an entire church and community. And if we were to take the gospel, and God's call for the church, seriously, we might think it would be a little bit absurd for us to divide and leave over things that just don't matter as much. Go with me here for a second. In scripture, Christians are compared to soldiers. So just as an illustration, I I wanna paint this picture for you. Let's say that you were assigned to a squad in the army under a certain leader. You know your mission, it's serious business, You wouldn't leave because you didn't like the directive given to you by your captain or you didn't, you you disagree with his strategy. You wouldn't leave. You wouldn't leave if you didn't like the sound or the personality of your fellow man's voice. You wouldn't leave because of some argument or some disagreement that was happening within your squad. You wouldn't leave for any of those things because your mission and your purpose is so much bigger than that. So in a spiritual sense, if the church is kind of like an army, if the church is the family of God, if it's the team, we can't leave over trivial small things. Our purpose is so much bigger than that. It's so much greater than that. There are real people out there who don't know the hope of Jesus. And that's our mission. So we have to stay. So when it says here that the early church devoted themselves to being the church, it meant they persisted and they stayed, and trust me, things for this church were about to get really tough. There was persecution and hardship and trouble coming their way, but they persisted, and they stayed. We're all devoted to something. Does your devotion for those other things match your devotion to the church, which is the bride of Christ? God loves his church. Do you love his church? Do I love his church the way that God loves his church? Okay, so that's just verse one. So we're gonna have to keep going a little bit quicker now. Verse 43 says this. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs being performed by the apostles. I won't spend too much time here, but the idea here is that the Holy Spirit was moving in power through this church so that everyone who saw some of these miraculous works believed, right? There were real healings going on. People that were being healed from being blind or death, real restoration of relationships happening. And it says here that everyone was filled with awe. This word awe, we sometimes take this to mean like amazement or wonder, but actually that word awe, it more clearly translates to fear or reverence. Not the scary kind of fear where people didn't want to know God, didn't want to interact with God, but the kind of fear and reverence where when people saw the things that were happening in this early church, they thought, man, there's a God and he's powerful and he's worthy of being worshiped. And you know what? I think my life would be better following that. I'm gonna submit my life to that God. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And verse 44 says this, it says all the believers were together. Circle that word together. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They were together. They were in the same place. I grew up in the country, but only on the weekends, which is exactly how I prefer to grow up in the countries, only on the weekends. And uh, I'm from Austin, Texas, but my, we had some, uh, some land that we would go visit up in Lampasas, which is just north. And uh, we would go out there with our family friends, my parents and their two best couple friends and all of us kids together. There's about 15 kids in total. And we just had a blast out in the country. We would canoe, we would hunt, we would hike, we would do all kinds of fun stuff. It was a great way to unplug. But by the end of the weekend with all of these kids together um, and there not being you know, enough technology use, 
the kids began to um, rebel quite a bit and there were little arguments and bickering and complaining and so in order to kind of keep the peace, my parents and their friends developed this game called um, Find Your Way Back Home. <laughs> I wish I was joking called Find Your Way Back Home. And what I'm about to tell you is actually a true story. They would blindfold each kid, put them in the back of a pickup truck, and they would drive us into some undisclosed location on the property, blindfolded. You don't need to call anybody, I'm 28 years old, even though half of you thought that I was 16 when I got up here, I'm fine. They blindfolded us and, and took us out into the middle of nowhere in the country. They got us out of the pickup truck, spun us around 10 times, sat us down and said, don't move until you can't hear the car engine anymore. Then you can take your blindfolds off and find your way back home. I'm not joking, this is real. So of course, at first it's fun. We take our blindfolds off and everybody's excited to you know, be without our parents and we're gonna find our way back home and we're, you know, we're all coming up with game plans and strategies, but very clearly it, you know, it, becomes, it becomes clear to us that we all have different strategies for how we think this should be done. One really smart person in our group thought, you know, let's look for the tire tracks and then let's follow the tire tracks all the way back to the house. That person was smarter, but that person wasn't listened to. Um, the next person thought, well, you know what? I actually memorized all of the turns that we took to get here when my, I was blindfolded, so I think I could take us back in the right direction. Just follow me and, and I'll, I'll guide us. Another team member thought they saw a light in the distance, so their idea was, let's just go straight through these trees and then follow the light until we get back home. No one could agree on a plan of action. And so because of that, there was arguing, there was yelling, there were tears, there were factions formed. It got very Lord of the Flies out there very quickly. And we decided to split up. We were like, we gotta get out of here. And everyone's going in their different directions. So everybody's getting up in arms, everyone's about to leave. And my youngest sister stands right in the middle of all of us with her arms stretched out like this. And she says, can't you see this is what the parents want? They're tearing us apart. And everybody kind of laughed and chilled out for a second. And we decided to band together. We would each listen to each other. And then we got back home and it was fine. Now, I will say this. Please don't judge my parents. They were just doing what they thought I think was good for us to, I don't know, become capable adults in the future. But I don't think I would recommend it because I still had to GPS my way here from Rockland this morning. So I don't think that it's, uh, you don't have to do that for your own kids. But for a serious moment, just for a second. Why was it important that the church was together? Why did that matter? This sounds as cheesy as any small groups campaign can be, but sincerely, the church is better when it's together. The church is operating in its fullness when every single one of us has committed to the vision and we are taking all of our different strategies and gifts and skill sets and we're committing to putting those into practice right here together. And you know what's crazy is that unity is the most confusing yet appealing thing to the outside world. Because the world knows division, right? The world knows how to divide. We've seen that over the course of the past five years. There are a million different preferences and opinions about how this country should be run, and we don't agree on any of them. And it's not even just that we don't agree, we can't even disagree in kindness as to how things are supposed to go. In every way possible, we are as distracted and divided as we could possibly be. But the world, they see something a little bit foreign and different when there's a group of people unified for something. It seems attractive, right? Everybody wants to belong to something that's whole. They wanna be known, they wanna be a part of something. When the church is operating at its best, like the early church, it's unified, it's connected, and the people on the outside looking in towards it, they wanna be a part of that. Why? Because a unified church displays the heart of Jesus towards people that desperately want to belong. Desperately want to belong. You think about people that have grown up in broken homes and they say, in the future, in my marriage, in my family, I'm gonna strive to have a complete, a whole home because everybody wants for wholeness. Everybody wants for unity, especially if you've experienced the opposite of unity, which is division. Now, I want you to hear this though. 
being together and having everything in common, this didn't mean that there wasn't diversity. Diversity is beautiful. Diversity of leadership, of strategy, all of this stuff in this context, diversity should be celebrated. But here's the beautiful part of diversity. Diversity is done best when it's in the context of togetherness. Diversity is done best when it's in the context of togetherness. Verse 45 says this, they sold property and possessions to give to anybody who had need. Their unity wasn't just lip service. It wasn't just words. It was actually rooted in sacrificial action. They sold their property and they sold their possessions to distribute to anybody who had need. Think about this, right? When, when uh, how many people, uh, when 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus on that day of Pentecost or more is what scholars would say. Think about this. Because all of the people, all of the new Christians, they had come in town for the Feast of Weeks for Pentecost. They had come in town for the celebration. They heard the gospel. They decided to give their lives to Jesus. And instead of going back to their old lives, they decided to stick around and see what this whole Jesus and Christianity thing was about. So when you talk about the early church, they were distributing their their possessions and, and they were selling their property and they were opening up their homes not just for needy people, but for new Christians who had just radically changed their life. They opened their homes to serve those new fellow Christians, the ones who didn't have a place to stay. They took care of the believers with needs and they took care of the new Christians. Doesn't this sound like exactly what the church is supposed to be? And again, just like togetherness, Togetherness is that like otherworldly quality, that unity that points to a God who is loving. Radical generosity is another one of those qualities that when people see it, when the outside world looks at it and they see that, it causes them to wonder about a radically generous and a radically loving God. Now, I am proud to say that uh, when I started working at Bayside a few years back, Anytime that I would go to the grocery store or to the doctor's office and someone would ask me where I work and I would say Bayside, it was always met with the same kind of response and it always sounded something like this. Oh, that's the church that does a lot of stuff for a lot of people. That's the church that does a lot of stuff for a lot of people. What an awesome reputation to have. Now, think about it this way, though. The, the, the church, the early church, it was filled with generosity, and it gave sacrificially to anybody who had need. But it wasn't just that they were giving, um, you know, throwing caution to the wind. They were giving, and they were being sacrificial in the early church because they were faith-filled. They thought about it in these two ways. They thought, well, you know what? I believe two things. I believe that when I sacrificially give to God's church and when I take care of the people in God's church— I know that with God, I will lack for nothing. So I'm never gonna be scared that if I give, God's not gonna take care of me. So first, they were faith-filled. They sold their property and their possessions because they believed that God was going to take care of them. But the second thing they believed, and if you write anything down today, I would write this down. The early church believed that God's church was the best investment. It gets better over time. My husband and I just started the process of looking for a house for the first time. And by the way, this process is, is really beginning stages. It basically is me sending him links to houses that I think would be cool, and then him responding with why that house is simply not going to work. And when we do look at houses, we walk in, and I'm like, this is beautiful in the backyard. It's awesome, and the kitchen's just solid, and he's like, you know, checking door frames and foundations and saying stuff about the roof. So what I'm learning is like, we actually don't, or we're not really sure what we want in the house just yet. But one thing I do know about looking for a house, my dad always said that a home is a great investment because a home appreciates in value. And I think this is true of the church. The church absolutely appreciates in value. The church only gets better And this wasn't just for them. This is for us. Think about it this way. If the church appreciates in value and it gets better over time, they would have been investing way back when in the church that we're sitting in today. 
They were investing in your future. Think about it this way. When you serve in middle school, in high school, in kids ministry, you are serving to teach and instruct the next generation of Jesus followers that will lead this church when you and me are gone. When you open your home up to that Thrive College student, that very smelly, sometimes weird Thrive College student, when you do that, you are creating a safe space for a young adult to come into your home and to grow and solidify in their faith while they're in school. When you decide to jump on the generosity journey and, and financially give through a place like Bayside, we're creating these breakaway kid camps and other things like it, where people in the community are bringing their children to come here for a week in the summer. And these kids, they hear the gospel and they fall in love with the church for the first time. And then they go home and they tell their parents how much they wanna come back to Bayside Blue Oaks. And then their parents are here and they hear the gospel and they are set free from all manners of, of brokenness and, and addiction and sin. Our reach is so much further beyond just this place. It extends way beyond these walls. The early church knew that, but they also knew this. The church extends way beyond just us. There's generations and generations and generations to come that are going to push the gospel forward. And you and me, we have part in that. The church is a great investment. So we're generous. The early church was generous, and we are generous. Verse 46 says this. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, first things first, don't get freaked out by the everyday part, because you're looking around right now, and you're like, if I have to see that joker every single day, I am not coming to church, and I understand that. But hear the heart behind this, right? The church of God was a family, you see your family every day, right? And that's normal, that's natural. You have an everydayness kind of relationship with them. And think about it this way too. You don't have to like your family, but you love your family and you're committed to them. So this, this church family was an everyday, life on life, togetherness kind of family. It says they continued to meet together in the temple courts. So they came to church and they prioritized coming to church on a weekly basis because it was good for their health, it was good for their faith, it was good for their relationships. But not just that, the church broke out of the temple walls and it went into the homes. Because this whole thing we're doing right here is awesome, but it's not meant to be once a week. The community that we have here is meant to get out of this and into homes where there's food and laughter and relationships and prayer and hardship and suffering, the real stuff that God has allowed for us to experience with one another in the temple courts and from house to house. But the thing that strikes me about, strikes me about this verse is the second half. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This tells me that the church was fun. There was gladness and sincerity as they were committed to being the church. God blessed their relationships. They had laughter and joy and amazement. The church was so fun. And that is God's design for you that you would experience the blessing of being a part of a fun and thriving church. But here is what I think is so important. I see so many people leave the church before it gets good. You leave because oh, I just didn't connect with anybody. Nobody looked at me. Oh, I went to that small group and it was fine, but it was so awkward and I just, I just cannot go back. We leave because it's not easy to get connected to a place to serve. We leave because it's not easy and we leave before it gets good. Guess what though? The way that this scripture is ordered it says the believers devoted themselves before they experienced gladness and sincerity. What if the thing that leads to joy and depth in these relationships, the thing that you're craving, what if the first step is actually commitment? What if the best kind of relationships are the ones who have been through things where it was hard to stay? Your husband, your wife, your kids, your lifelong best friends, you've been through some hard stuff together. And it produces a beautiful depth and a joy in your relationships that you just can't get anywhere else. 
What if before you experience the gladness and the joy and the ease of being a part of the church, and trust me, it has all of those qualities. What if the first step is actually devotion? What if it's commitment? Last but not least, verse 47. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. The church should have two directions that it's moving, moving towards. The first direction is towards God. You should be a, a part of a church that loves God and moves towards God. And the second thing is you should be a part of a church that moves towards and loves the people that God loves. Those are the two directions, towards God and towards the people that God loves. And if you're here at Bayside Blue Oaks for the first time and you haven't fully decided where you're gonna land, you actually don't have to land here. We'd love for you to, but wherever you land, my encouragement to you would be to, to search through that lens. Does this church love God? And does this church love the people that God loves? The second half of this verse is very encouraging. And the Lord added to their number daily, those who are being saved. The church grew from 120 people to over 3,000 in one Holy Spirit-filled sermon, and God was not done. The church right now in this room is actually, this is not enough people knowing Jesus for God to be satisfied enough. God didn't look at this room and think, you know what? That one is good, we're gonna cut this one off here. That is not how God thinks of his church. God says in his word that his desire is for all people to be saved, and because of that, God is going to continue to bring people in. God is going to continue to grow this church because healthy churches are growing churches. But what's funny is that when I tell people I work at Bayside and I invite them to come along, one of the pieces of feedback I get is, it's just too big. I'm skeptical of big churches. I just don't know how it all works and I just don't know that it's genuine or sincere. I just don't know that I have a place there. And I understand the sentiment, but at the same time, when you think about that complaint, in comparison to the early church, the church that we have as an example in scripture, it seems a little bit silly. And I understand why. I talk to people who look at the big church and they think, and myself included, I look at the big church and I look at all of the staff members and the pastors and the volunteers and I think, that's way too big for me to have any value there. They have so many people serving. They have so many people leading small groups. They don't need me. I'm gonna go find somewhere smaller when I can actually fit in. That couldn't be further from the truth. Let's do the math for a second, okay? Let's say that there were 120, this is rough math. There was 120 original believers before Pentecost. 120 people that were mature enough to be able to disciple others. If minimum 3,000 people came to faith for the first time, each of those 120 mature believers would have had to disciple minimum 25 people for the church to grow, for the church to mature. A big church does not mean that God doesn't need you. A big church, a thriving big church means that your gifts are essential and we need more called, committed disciple makers who are willing to dig in and to invest and give what they have to serve and to lead and to rally community around you. I believe that God is calling this church today in one of many different directions, but I'm gonna name a couple. God is calling you to make a step today and God is calling me to take a step today. What step is God calling you to? Have you been coming to Bayside Blue Oaks for a few months now? Maybe a few different churches, you're trying things out, trying to figure out which church meets your preferences and maybe today God's saying, hey, it's time to commit my church is about more than this. Maybe you're in here today and you don't have community here. And it's not because the people aren't nice, it's because you haven't dug in and tried. Maybe today God is calling you to join a small group or to lead a small group. Side tangent, but I used to do small groups at our Granite Bay campus and people complain all the time about there not being enough small groups. But where are the leaders? Maybe you've been coming here for a bit and you see a lot of holes a lot of problems, 
usually the problems you can point out are the problems that you know how to fix. Maybe God's calling you to take a step towards serving today and giving back to this church. Or maybe God convicted your heart today that his church really is the greatest investment. And maybe you're ready to jump on the generosity journey and start to give. I don't know what God is calling you to do today, but I know that the time is now to devote ourselves to God's church because we are better when we're together. And the church can be unstoppable at reaching people for Christ if we were to decide to dig in and give it all we have. We can do that together. God can change this whole group of people and call a whole group of people. So I'm gonna pray for you. But before I pray for you, whatever next step you want to make today, I want you to pull out your phones and text the two words, Blue Oaks, B-L-U-E-O-A-K-S to 56316 and take a next step. But I also want you to attend Intro to Bayside. It's a meeting that talks about how to get involved in every single thing I just said. The time is now. There's no more delaying. We need every single one of you. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for this morning. And we ask that what we prayed for at the beginning of this, of this day, that, that that had come to pass. God, we pray that you, that you have changed our hearts in this time, that you would have called us to dig in and to commit to serving and loving your church. God, we pray that you would grow this church to be unstoppable in our reach for people, in our compassion towards people, in our generosity towards people. And I ask that you knit us together in closeness and in community and help us to experience the blessing of what it's like to be around other Jesus followers and to walk in life with them. So God, we love you and we thank you so much for this day. It's in your precious and holy and perfect name that we pray.